Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. In this bonus video, which accompanies my video on the origin, structure and exploration of the Moon, I'm going to go into the Apollo missions in a bit more detail. You don't need to know all this if you're just revising for the Astronomy GCSE. We'll talk about what the Apollo missions were, what their purpose was, how they got to the Moon, and what they achieved when they got there. Following the Second World War, two superpowers emerged, the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. They had opposing views on how society should work, capitalism or communism, and might have gone to war over this. But they both had enormous arsenals of nuclear weapons, and war would likely have destroyed both countries. So instead, they engaged in the space race, a proxy war to show which side was supreme in space. On screen is a summary of space firsts. Have a look at this list, and it's looking a lot like the USSR was winning. So, in 1962, US President Kennedy said, We choose to go to the moon in this decade. This was a month after the first American in space. This would be a big undertaking. It's worth noting that Kennedy did ask Khrushchev, the USSR premier, to consider a joint venture, but sadly he wasn't interested. Kennedy was assassinated the next year, but the project was underway, and in 1967, the first crewed mission was due to take off. However, a month before, during a launch rehearsal, an electrical fire started. The cabin quickly filled with smoke, and the increased internal air pressure made it impossible to open the hatch. Tragically, all three crew members, Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger Chaffee, died. Many changes were made to future Apollo craft, not least an outward opening hatch to prevent this ever happening again. In honour of the crew, NASA renamed the project to the crew's unofficial name, Apollo, although it's unclear why they chose the Greek god of the sun for a moon mission. The next crewed Apollo mission was Apollo 7 in 1968. They launched successfully, orbited the Earth for 11 days, and tested all features of the CSM, or Command and Service, module. This fulfilled Apollo 1's mission, uncovering a few technical problems which engineers fixed for future missions. Unfortunately, one of the crew took a cold up with him, and by the time they came back they were all suffering. They refused to wear their helmets during re-entry, and were banned from any future missions. Later in 1968, Apollo 8 took astronauts to the moon for the first time. They took three days to get there, orbited ten times, and returned in another three days. They were orbiting the moon on Christmas Eve, and gave a live TV broadcast, reading the first ten verses of the Bible. At the time, this was the most watched TV program in history. They also took the famous Earthrise picture, showing the Earth rising above the moon's surface. You can only see the Earth rise from orbit. This doesn't happen from the surface of the Moon because it is tidally locked to the Earth, as discussed in my video on the Moon's appearance and features. Frank Borman fell ill with space adaptation sickness, and his two fellow astronauts had to clean up floating bits of vomit and diarrhoea. Apollo 9, in March of 1969, only went into Earth orbit for a critical test. The Apollo spacecraft used a command module, CM, and a service module, SM, which together are called the CSM. It also has a lunar landing module, LM. The LM needed to separate from the CSM, land on the moon, and later redock with the CSM. Apollo 9 performed the first test to make sure this worked as expected. The mission also involved a two-man spacewalk and the first use of the extravehicular mobility unit, or space jetpack. You may have seen this in the movie Gravity. Apollo 9 was delayed to let the crew get over a cold, but a crew member still got space adaptation sickness. Doctors analysed the likely causes, and this was the last such incident in the Apollo missions. Apollo 10, in May 1969, was a dress rehearsal for the first moon landing, involving everything except actually landing on the moon. They took off from Earth, orbited a few times, and headed to the moon. Once there, they undocked the LM, descended to an altitude of 14 kilometers, and surveyed Apollo 11's future landing site, choosing the best place to land. They then flew back up to the CSM, redocked, 
and returns to Earth. Apollo 10 is notable for the first colour TV broadcast from space, and also the first Apollo mission that didn't feature vomit. Finally, in July 1969, Apollo 11 made the first human moon landing. A million people gathered in fields and highways and beaches around Kennedy Space Center to watch the launch on the 16th of July. Three days later, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins entered lunar orbit. The next day, Armstrong and Aldrin entered the landing module Eagle, undocked from the command module Columbia and headed down to the moon to the Sea of Tranquility, landing successfully at 2017 on the 20th of July. At 2.56 the next morning, Neil Armstrong became the first person to walk on the moon. Buzz Aldrin was also a Presbyterian minister and became the first person to perform a religious ceremony on another world when he took communion in the lunar lander. Armstrong and Aldrin walked on the moon for two and a half hours. They planted an American flag, collected 20 kilograms of rock and dust samples, deployed various scientific experiments, which we'll talk about later, and left a few mementos for future astronauts. For a day, Armstrong and Aldrin were on the moon, but Michael Collins was in orbit aboard Columbia. When his orbits took him to the far side of the moon, he lost contact with Earth and the Eagle was further from another human than anybody had ever been. When asked later, Collins said that he never felt lonely. He had a lot to do, and he knew that his job was crucial to the successful return of the mission. Collins took this photo of the eagle descending to the moon. With the earth in the background, every human who ever lived is in the frame of the photograph, except Michael Collins. Almost the day after landing, Armstrong and Aldrin flew the Eagle back up and docked with Columbia. The three then headed back to Earth. Three days later, they separated the command module from the service module, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, and splashed down in the Pacific to be recovered by the US Navy. There was a very small concern that they could have brought back pathogens from the moon's surface, so they spent three weeks in quarantine. When they were released, they toured the USA and the world, meeting many world leaders and seeing millions of people in parades. Apollo 12, in November 1969, was very similar to Apollo 11, but achieved more. Building on the experience from the first landing, they stayed on the moon for nearly eight hours and deployed a full scientific package. Apollo 11 had only taken some of the desired experiments. Alan Bean broadcast the first colour video from the moon's surface, but then he pointed the camera at the sun and broke it. 36 seconds after launch, Apollo 12 was struck by lightning, but luckily this didn't endanger the mission. If you've watched the movie Apollo 13, you'll know this story. The movie stayed very close to the actual events. Apollo 13 successfully took photographs of areas on the moon considered interesting by the last two missions, and they analysed the electrical properties of Earth's atmosphere to try to understand why Apollo 12 was struck by lightning. However, 56 hours into the mission, there was an electrical fault in an oxygen tank. The tank exploded, damaging several other systems, including fuel cells and the crew's oxygen supply. Okay, we've had a problem here. The moon landing had to be aborted, and instead the crew went once around the moon, using its gravity to send them back to Earth. The command module's power and oxygen supplies were out so the crew moved to the landing module, which was designed for two astronauts, not three. Without full power, they lost heating, and temperatures reached a low of 4 degrees Celsius. More dangerous was carbon dioxide buildup, which can be fatal. The CO2 scrubbers in the LM were designed for two astronauts for one day, and wouldn't cope with three astronauts for the four-day return. They used additional CO2 scrubbers from the CM, but these weren't compatible with the LM's systems. Ground crew had to invent a way to connect them together. The repair efforts were successful, and all three crew returned safely to Earth. 
In this photo, you can see the damage done to the service module. The altered trajectory around the moon meant that the crew of Apollo 13 travelled further above the far side of the moon and further from Earth than anybody else in history. Apollo 14, in early 1971, was the first to visit the lunar highlands. They deployed further scientific experiments in over nine hours of moonwalking. One of the rocks brought back was recently found to be a meteorite from Earth, ejected from our planet about four billion years ago. It lay protected on the moon undisturbed while Earth rocks were recycled due to tectonic activity. And it's the oldest known Earth rock. Also, Alan Shepard became the first person to play golf on the moon. Apollo 15 launched in July 1971. While it was similar to the last few missions, it was the first to use the Lunar Roving Vehicle, aka Moon Buggy. On this mission, David Scott dropped a hammer and a feather at the same time. The video of this shows them falling at the same rate in the absence of air resistance. How about that? Although, if Galileo was wrong, they never would have actually reached the moon. Apollo 16 landed deep in the old lunar highlands to collect the oldest moon rocks yet. All missions past Apollo 17 had just been cancelled, so to make the most of the limited time left, the astronauts trained in geology to recognise scientifically interesting rocks. Using the buggy they gained some excellent science from craters and large boulders, helping us to understand the moon's formation. Apollo 17, in December 1972, took the last astronauts to the moon. They spent longer on the moon's surface, completed the scientific experiment deployments, and did a lot of geology. But they also took extra crew, five pocket mice, to study the effect of cosmic rays on them. One mouse died in flight and the other four suffered lesions, but this was not thought to be related to cosmic rays or spaceflight. The six successful moon landings planted several scientific experiments on the moon's surface, called Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package, or ALSEP. Seismic monitors measured moonquakes and micrometeorite impacts, and helped us determine the internal structure of the moon. Magnetometers measured the moon's very weak magnetic field. Solar wind and ion detectors measured the solar wind on the moon, as it has almost no atmosphere. Heat flow detectors measured the flow of heat through the moon's surface. Only one ALSEP is still working. You may have seen a Big Bang Theory episode where they use it. Cars and bikes have small retro reflectors, which reflect light directly back at its source. The Moon has several much larger retro reflectors, and scientists on Earth can shine a laser at them, measure the time it takes for the light to be reflected back to us, and determine the distance to the Moon within just a few centimetres. This showed that the Moon is receding from us at a current rate of about 3.8 centimetres a year. So I hope you enjoyed that. You don't need to know all this for the GCSE but it's an amazing success story of human bravery and ingenuity, and one of the greatest things humanity has achieved, a real inspiration for us all. Hopefully we'll be going back soon. Thank you for watching, goodbye, and have an excellent day.